Olaf Scholz presented a huge fiscal plan, and it included a pretty decent sized number measured in euros, billions, right? But when you measure it as a percent of GDP, I think it was 0.07. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, peanuts. Absolutely. Um, you're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by and recent price ranges, right, left, and center, including in crypto space, if we accept the notion that Bitcoin is a digital commodity. Welcome to this edition of Macro Sunday. My name is Andreas Steno, uh, and as per usual, I host this week the show together with you, Miguel Oswald. Welcome to you. Thanks a lot. Partner here at Steno Research, um, and you lead our offering within geopolitics. Miguel, we've had a week of material gains in what I typically label as China-related assets, at least until Friday, uh, where we saw a setback in uh, markets in conjunction with the lack of a rate cut from the Chinese central bank. But Miguel, overall, it seems like the optimism around China is gaining momentum out there. Absolutely. That story, which we've been talking about for weeks, is, is mm-hmm. definitely spreading out there, spreading into commodity space. Uh, we, we'll get into some of the metals here. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, also driven by the, the 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 reacceleration going on in the US, I think. But yeah. obviously, China is the the link to commodities in many ways. Yeah, yeah, just just as a matter of fact, China is, of course, the largest buyer, for example, copper. Yeah. Um, so that's that's an obvious link between China and the, the commodity market. But Miguel, if we look at the fiscal consensus for this year, um, we've seen, I think, a tripling of the GDP consensus among economists for the U.S. economy in 2024. So the U.S. economy has turned into almost a growth miracle uh, in consensus terms, but we're yet to see any moves when it comes to the German GDP consensus, the Chinese GDP consensus. Is that maybe the next story here? Yeah, could be. Two two potential explanations. One is, of course, the time lag. I think this this change in sentiment around the U.S. economy has been really really really, really swift. Mm. It's it's not. If you look back three or four months, everybody was talking about either a recession or a soft landing. Yeah. And now we're at a rocket launch instead, <laughs> instead of a soft landing, basically. Yeah. So so things have really shifted over the past quarter. That's one thing. Maybe it'll take some time to to to, to, to shift over to, to maybe China's coming out to Europe as well. The second thing is, and we'll, as we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, Europe is lagging behind on in government investments compared to, go, to mm. China and the US. Uh, US and China governments are, are pumping money, uh, uh, f- fiscal stimulus, basically, into their, into their economies. Europe is not doing that to the same extent. No. Um, on Friday morning, we received the monthly numbers out of China on money growth. Um, and one thing I note uh, in, in the monthly numbers is that the so-called M0, so the base layer of money, is growing at a very rapid pace in China. That's been an ongoing trend basically since 23. So at least they're trying to pump up the system uh, via liquidity additions from the central bank, by accepting a larger fiscal deficit uh, at the People's uh, Congress, was it last week? And yet we still struggle um, with the, uh, or they still struggle with the lack of consumer sentiment. Uh, And one way of showing that in a chart is when you look at the base layer money growth, M0 versus M2, so a broader measure of money, it still seems like they struggle with getting the private sector, um, households, etc., to multiply that base layer of money via credit. Um, and ultimately, that is very linked to the housing market, it seems. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. A lot of Chinese people have their entire uh, estates or their entire fortunes uh, locked up in, in, in real estate. Mm-hmm. And and uh, uh, w- with all the turmoil, all the uncertainty around the, the real estate sector, it makes sense that you're not going to take out bigger loans to, to, to invest in, in, mm-hmm. in, in your homes, in secondary homes, or, or investing in, 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 in the furnishment of your home. So so, so I think that's... And, and the Chinese government has has realized or accepted this and acknowledged this to, to some extent, that they have to support the real estate market to get the consumer class growing and going in China. Yeah. And that's a very important point because on Friday, uh, the People's Bank of China did not cut the medium-term lending facility rate. But bear in mind, the 20th of March, they'll take a decision on the funding rate related to mortgage costs. And in January, they cut that interest rate, that five-year interest rate by 50 basis points. So it seems like they've changed their focus to 
measures allowing for a better consumer sentiment. Yeah, absolutely. It is the focus of the Chinese government, mm. uh, uh, and it is the grand plan to drive China forward, essentially. And, 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 and this year is going to be one of the first where we see the Chinese government really shift its focus to building this consumer class. We'll see how well it works, uh, or, or uh, uh, how much steam that can catch from perhaps uh, increases in manufacturing. Also. Yeah. But Miguel, when, when we talk about stimulus, um, it seems like the European Union lags behind uh, by miles. Um, if you look at the industrial policies of the uh, of the US and China, they're obviously very focused on subsidizing various sectors in manufacturing, for example, uh, but also in within R&D of various green tech pro- projects and so on and so forth. While the European Union sounds like they're kind of stuck on repeat saying, hey, this is unfair competition. Yeah. Uh, Please stick to the rules. Um, we're we're going to play by the rules, so we're not going to support our uh, <laughs> manufacturing sectors. What's going on within the European Union on this topic? I mean, it seems like we're stuck um, yeah. way behind. There are several reasons for this. One of them is the ghost of 2011, of, of, of the big debt crisis within the Eurozone. Uh, we're very scared of seeing some countries going to the brink of, of, of bankruptcy, which could lead to the collapse of the Euro. That's one thing. Mm. So Europe as a whole, as a political entity, is still very much focused on a financial convergence on keeping budget deficits to a minimum. Uh, and then, of course, Europe is sometimes, uh, Europe is clearly lacking the US and China right now when it comes to to how much money the government pumps into the economy. We've simply been, been caught off guard, hasn't been the, uh, on the forefront of this, ten, uh, the, this trend, and that is leaving Europe uh, basically, yeah, lagging behind. Um, one of the problems is that Europe has no central government who can decide to do this. I mean, the European government, uh, the, the, the European Parliament, the European Commission cannot issue debt in the same way as national governments can. So it's still very much up to individual countries, especially some of the main drivers like Germany and France. France have been expanding their fiscal deficit. They always do. Germans haven't. Uh, the Scandinavian countries haven't really. So, 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 so we're still waiting to see that. And I still think there's uh, uh, the ghost of 2011, as I call it, is, is still a very big factor in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, on the other hand, it could leave Europe better suited for an upcoming crisis if, if, if debt levels are, are lower. A few weeks ago, both Bloomberg, FT, Wall Street Journal, etc. reported that uh, Olaf Scholz presented a huge fiscal plan. And it included a pretty decent sized number measured in euros, billions, right? But when you measure it as a percent of GDP, I think it was 0.07. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, peanuts. Absolutely. Um, the good old... Schuldenbremse, I think that's what it's called in German. I think that the most known um, <laughs> label for it in English is Black Zeros, um, that policy mix in Germany, designed to keep the, bolus, uh, the, the, the budget in, in check, so to speak. Um, what are the latest trends around this in Germany? Because it actually seems like politicians want to spend, but they cannot. Yeah. So, so back in November, I think it was, the German government tried to, to take some money that is it, because... Let's start in another place. Germany has this debt break uh, mm. built into its constitution where they cannot spend more than, I think it's 0.5% deficit mm. every year unless you're in an emergency. Mm. The pandemic was obviously an emergency, so the government had increased uh, uh, the ability to to spend more than mm. that. Then uh, s- some of the, the, the money allocated for the pandemic wasn't, wasn't used for the pandemic. It was over faster than, than, than feared. And the government wanted to transfer some of these billions of euros into green uh, transition projects, essentially. And the German constitutional court ruled that as illegal because because those money were only uh, legal to spend because Germany was in an emergency. So unless Ger- Germany is in an emergency again, you cannot spend this, this level of money. Uh, the, the easy solution is to simply say that Germany is in a, an emergency again. Either because of Ukraine? Or, or because yeah. of a climate uh, yeah. emergency. But that w- would really be, 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 be to, to bend the rules. Uh, uh, that would essentially leave Germany in, in, a, in constant emergency, <laughs> basically. So, so, so that's, that's not really a solution. Instead, German, uh, the German politicians are obviously debating whether to, 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 to simply uh, reform this debt, debt break and mm. uh, to change the constitution in, into allowing uh, the German government to, to, to to have bigger deficits. So Germany is moving in that direction. The The reason why this is especially relevant is that, that this rule was essentially the the blueprint for the, uh, the the convergence program of the European Union, which yeah. more or less translated this rule to to, to be in, in, in effect for all of the European Union. Uh, not quite as strict, but still limits on how much you can spend. Hasn't really been enforced that much, was put out of place or put put out of effect during the pandemic. But... but, but uh, 
if Germany decides to 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 loosen this policy, it will also loosen the policy for for the rest of Europe. So so in that way, uh, Germany could be the driver for for bigger government spending, which has, I think is is inevitable over the coming years. Yeah. Um, and if you take a look at debt to GDP ratio since 2020, it's quite obvious uh, when you look at the numbers that a country like Italy utilized this window of opportunity Absolutely. Absolutely. during the emergency um, to borrow and spend. Uh, and it could be one of the very clear reasons why we still have better growth momentum in Southern Europe, uh, that they've actually borrowed <laughs> to spend. Um, exactly what's going on in the US. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, so so this is, I think, the key question for the euro market over the course of the year, whether the Germans poli German politicians will make progress towards amending this yeah. debt break. Yeah, especially. And also the talks in the European Union on this, how, 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 how will they attempt to enforce the convergence program? How much will they allow Eastern Europe to, to go into deficits as well? So yeah, this is good old fiscal, exp uh, fiscal expansionism. Yeah. And uh, when we look at various live gauges of the German economy, we, we run now costs via both electricity consumption, uh, truck toll mileages and stuff like that. Uh, it seemed like we had an uptick through January. Now I'm kind of convincing myself that it was a head fake. Um, uh, one of our clients sent me an article suggesting that this uptick in uh, electricity consumption Uh, was driven by the, the non-private sector, basically. Um, so, so that's at least a, a very interesting um, angle on this, and that is, to me, the interesting schism right now because we see oil, copper, silver, uh, a lot of these commodities linked to the industrial cycle performing, while we haven't seen an actual uptick in production yet. No. At least I'm unaware of where it is um, as of now. So the good question here is, Mikkel, whether the Mr. Market, Dr. Copper, as we typically yeah. call him in market terms, has sniffed something out here in, in relation to what's upcoming from, from the actual production. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it 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 must be some 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 mix of anticipation of euro real acceleration, mm. and 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 uh, linked to that, obviously, uh, expectation of that that Chinese manufacturing will will explode basically yeah. <laughs> over coming quarters. Uh, 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 that must be it because uh, it's it's absolutely correct. And the, the situation for a German manufacturer is basically that their their uh, uh, input costs are, are rising, but their order books aren't aren't getting filled anymore. Yeah. So 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 it's uh, yeah the, that is definitely a schism, and we'll we'll. We'll have to see, but it's uh, never very interesting. To I'll put it in other words, Miguel. At least their input costs are very <laughs> elevated. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that they're exactly rising anymore, but they're just yeah. so much higher yeah. than they were in 2020, and also comparable to, um, to or relative to 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 U.S. input prices. What we've seen over the past week is that producer prices in the U.S. keep reaccelerating, mm -hmm. while the early evidence that we have from Eurozone or proxy Eurozone countries uh, is one of a small decline on the month in producer prices. So this divergence in input prices in the US versus Europe, I mean, from bizarre levels, uh, is one that we have remained very much on top of. And it also seems like ahead of a big central bank week next week that this divergence could spill over to interest rate gaps rising between the US and Europe. That's the interesting part. Yeah. So, Miguel, um, with commodities thriving, um, with momentum for the divergence between the US and Europe, I think it's time to listen to the Donald Trump soundbite of the week because this obviously relates to the commodity landscape post the Ukraine war. And, you, I mean, you can say a lot of things about Donald Trump, but he got this one right, so let's listen to him. Uh, it's very sad when Germany makes a massive oil and gas deal with Russia where you're supposed to be guarding against Russia and Germany goes out and pays billions and billions of dollars a year to Russia. So we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting all of these countries. And then numerous of the countries go out and make a pipeline deal with Russia where they're paying billions of dollars into the coffers of Russia. So we're supposed to protect you against Russia, but they're paying billions of dollars to Russia. 
And I think that's very inappropriate. And the former chancellor of Germany is the head of the pipeline company that's supplying the gas. Uh, ultimately, Germany will have almost 70 percent of their country controlled by Russia with natural gas. So you tell me, is that appropriate? I mean, we've, I've been complaining about this from the time I got in. It should have never been allowed to have happened. But Germany is totally controlled by Russia because they were getting from 60 to 70 percent of their energy from Russia and a new pipeline. And you tell me if that's appropriate, because I think it's not. And I think it's a very bad thing for NATO, and I don't think it should have happened. Now, it- <laughs> this is from a very famous coffee date or lunch date between Jens Stoltenberg, um, the Norwegian heading uh, the NATO, and Donald Trump. And he obviously refers to Gerhard Schroeder being in charge of Gazprom. Um, he refers to the interlinks between Russia and Germany in the energy policy mix. Uh, and here is it four or five years later. Um, you have to admit that Donald Trump was on point here. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and, and the thing is, Jens Stoltenberg and politicians like him, uh, also with him when he was prime minister of Norway, they knew this, but it was a footnote to them. It didn't really matter because oil would keep flowing from Russia. So, so why shouldn't we buy the cheap, yeah. the cheap oil and gas from over there? So, so that's that's what you really got wrong. Uh, that that uh, um, that whole setup of of, of relying on, on Russian natural gas, and, and Trump and other U.S. presidents and administration were absolutely right on this point. We have to admit that. Yeah. So um, the big question here is whether the drop that we've seen in input prices in Europe from abysmal levels yeah. uh, will be enough to revive the European momentum. I don't think we have enough evidence to say so yet, but China is getting there and um, Mr. Market is sniffing something out in relation to the global manufacturing cycle. But speaking of commodities, I think it's time to invite our uh, head of crypto research here at Steno Research uh, to the floor here at Macro Sunday to discuss whether Bitcoin can be seen as a commodity because that's one of the main narratives out there. Is it like a digital version of gold? Uh, and oh boy, we've seen inflows to uh, to Bitcoin again over the past week. And um, for those of you who listen to this podcast week in and week out, you'll know by now that Mass Eberhard, our head of cryptocurrency, uh, that he loves the song called Kernkraft. <laughs> so here it is, um, again, introducing Mass Eberhard to the Macro Sunday podcast. It's now time to say hello to Mess Eberhard, our head of crypto research here at uh, Steno Research. Great to see you again, Mess. Thank you, you too. And um, well, it seems like <laughs> you're in a joyful <laughs> mood yes, week am. in and week out at the moment. Yes. I think. Uh, your crypto portfolio is up plus 70% since launch, more or less. Yeah, I think actually we're at uh, 55 now, with the correction these uh, ah, okay. past few days. So down to 55. Oh boy, what a mess. Yes, uh, what a mess. But never mind, mess. Um, whether it's 70 or 55%, it's pretty decent return in a it matter is. of a couple of months. Um, the big question, now that we're talking commodities today in uh, in the Macro Sunday podcast, is whether we can label parts of the crypto space as commodities. It's been a debate that's been ongoing in the media basically since the launch of Bitcoin. For sure. Um, so what's your take? Let's start with Bitcoin. Yes. Is it fair to say that it's it's a commodity? I think it is. So at least in a legal perspective, so we know that uh, the SEC in the US, uh, their chair, man, uh, a guy called Gary Gensler, he says that, that he's pretty sure that Bitcoin is a commodity and also arguably maybe the only commodity. Yeah. So that's an illegal perspective. But I think also in a lot of different other aspects, it is a commodity. So it, we know that that uh, for a fact that it is marginally priced, meaning that that pretty much uh, the cost of producing a Bitcoin will often be equal to the price of Bitcoin, pretty much uh, close also to, to normal commodities. Uh, at the same time, 
there's also a, a scarce supply of Bitcoin, which oh. also pretty much equals, at least to some extent, a commodity. And also the fact that it is a pretty constant the issuance of, uh, of Bitcoin. Yeah. But when we look at the commodity space in the physical world, <laughs> yes. um, we typically distinguish between commodities used for actual production and then commodities used as some kind of store of value. Yes. Take the example of silver versus gold. Silver is actually used yes. in manufacturing to a large extent, uh, while gold is not. Yes. So is it fair to compare Bitcoin to gold? Or, or how do you see this? I mean, is there any practical use of Bitcoin? And that's actually the uh, the the problem with Bitcoin itself. So uh, Bitcoin maximalists, they will tell you probably that there are a lot of use cases, but the reality is that there are very, very few use cases. So you cannot pay with Bitcoin in anywhere, uh, mainly due to the fact that it's not scalable at all. Mm. Uh, but then there's the store of value narrative, which is, uh, I will also admit that it is, is a super strong narrative. Uh, but that also equals that it is much more uh, closely related to Bitcoin in that in that sense, because uh, it is not used other than being pretty much a store of value like gold. So the digital gold is essentially what we should label it as when we talk about the commodity case yes, within crypto. Exactly. Um, if we look at the Bitcoin case right now, obviously the ETFs were launched recently. Uh, we had a record inflow on a day during the past week. Yes. We we touched upon a thousand million yes, we did. dollars in one day. So to put this in context, such an inflow that the inflow that we've seen in Bitcoin ETFs, how much of the market is it? So if we say that that if we estimate that at least four million bitcoins they have been lost forever, yeah. whereof we know that the Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of, of Bitcoin controls about 1.1 mm. uh, million ETH that we estimate pretty much lost uh, for good. And so if we, we if we say that at least those 4 million are lost mm. for good, uh, then we pretty much have a circulating supply of Bitcoin of around 15.6 15, uh, 15. million. Mm. And then this actually equals, so uh, the re- record inflow we saw on Tuesday this week, which was just... Uh, just above uh, one one billion US dollars is actually around ten basis points of the complete crypt, uh, sorry Bitcoin market cap, which is <laughs> uh, quite a lot mm. compared that it is so it was only one trading session and it is even the net net inflow so Grayscale still saw an outflow mm. uh, so it is it, it's just a crazy uh, crazy inflow but however we also saw on on Thursday. There, the net inflow was only like I think it was around 150 uh, million. So it, it's 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 fluctuates a lot. It's even yeah. more volatile than than the uh, <laughs> than the Bitcoin price itself. But uh, I guess it's kind of safe to say that given this is a scarce <laughs> resource, if you see inflows of say on average three four hundred billion yes. a day, the price needs to go up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It <laughs> I does. mean, it, it's it's yes. as simple as that, right? Yeah. Uh, so. We need to track this ETF flow on a daily basis because yeah, yeah. it will be one of the early warning signals yes. to get out in case. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. But speaking of ETFs, um, obviously, we've discussed it before, Mass, that we could see an ETF uh, for Ethereum as well. Yes. Um, launch date within a couple of months, right? Uh, so, potentially. Yeah, uh, so if it will come this year, then it is most likely coming in the end of May. Mm. We know that the SEC, the US SEC, they need to either approve or deny one of the Ethereum spot ETF applications on the latest of May uh, 23. Yeah. So if they will approve it, then they will most likely approve this one, which is from the, an issuer called uh, Van Eck. Mm. But then they will at the same time approve all the other ones because they don't want to uh, to give any issuer a first mover advantage. Yep. But if they actually deny it, then it's it's most likely not coming this year then. And we obviously don't know with any uh, degree of certainty yet. You've put a 90% probability yes. of this happening, uh, the, the approval that is. Yes. Uh, so let's see. Uh, it would obviously be math- massive news for the Ethereum for sure. uh, community as well. But Mass, it doesn't come without potential obstacles for the Ethereum yes. community yes. either. Uh, Ethereum puts a lot of emphasis on being a decentralized community or network. Yes. Um, 
assuming that this new launch of ETFs takes a power grab, mm. <laughs> if you know what I mean, on the Ethereum network. Yes. How do you solve that issue? I mean, let's assume that they grab 10% of the outstanding. Yeah. Is that it's, a big issue for the network? It is, it is actually, because we know that, that uh, many of these issues, they are really looking to, to stake EFA as the, the underlying asset, because then they can give uh, their clients even more rewards, and they can also grab a fee of that. Yeah. Probably if the SEC, they approve an Ethereum spot ETF this year, then they will not approve uh, the EFA to be staked at the same time. But it is just a matter of time, whether that be in two, three, or five years, before the SEC, they will have to approve an ETF where EFA is staked. Mm. And, and staking here means sort of the proof of yes. staking uh, when a transaction happens exactly. on the network, right? So, yeah. so actually, uh, about 18 months ago, uh, Ethereum uh, transitioned from what we define as proof of work, which is also the consensus mechanism used by Bitcoin, mm. to the consensus mechanism used by pretty much all other cryptocurrencies now, which is proof of stake, mm. meaning instead of miners, then it is you as a holder, you can decide to be a staker. Mm. That means you put up uh, 32 Ether to be a validator, and then you actually uh, use that Ether to verify transactions on the network. Mm. The problem is there is that then it is no longer uh, miners and, and node operators that really decides the faith of of, uh, of the network, as in the example of Bitcoin, but it is, instead it is the holders. Mm. So if these, which I think it has really been uh, something that we have started to look at, especially now when we can see the blockbuster success of the Bitcoin spot ETFs, mm. and we see absolutely no reason not to believe that it would be a similar success for, for Ethereum, mm. and then suddenly they can, we already now, like we expect in, in the, the next month maybe that, that these Bitcoin body TF, they will control at least 5% of the total Bitcoin supply. Mm -hmm. So that's even not estimated that 4 million are lost. If they do that in the same case of Ethereum and they stake it at the same time, then, then, then probably uh, traditional finance and these issues, they will have a, a huge amount of the total staked Ether, meaning that they can at worst pretty much control the network in the future. Mm. And obviously that's kind of the worst case scenario for a decentralized <laughs> network. Sure. Um, so how do they solve it? That's the problem. <laughs> uh, so this is, of course, this can either be two years in the future, it can be three, it can be mm. five years, but it's something that the Ethereum community needs to look at, especially now when they can have seen how much capital these, uh, these Bitcoin ETFs, they really attract. Mm. So uh, one way to solve it is to... Uh, to uh, realize more what we define as solo stakers, meaning that it could be uh, you, Andreas, it could be me staking mm. our, our EFA in our own basement. We know that around 5% of the network right now is, uh, is uh, staked by what we define as, as uh, solo stakers. So it's really like really small percentage of the network, mainly because it is pretty... Uh, you need to be pretty skilled technically, mm. and there's also like other risks involved in doing that. So one way to to uh, to achieve more uh, solo stakers is by making it easier. Yeah. But this will not solve the the whole problem. One way, and probably the most attractive way for the community to solve it, is to uh, to make even more what we call uh, liquid staking protocols. Yeah. So these are. Uh, decentralized, often decentralized protocols, which basically uh, stakes your ether and in return give you, gives you a, a token, which pretty much is your guarantee that they uh, have one ether every time you, you give them one ether mm. and that ether is, is staked. By doing that, then, um, then you can still uh, retain the decentralized uh, nature of the network. Mm. Uh, while actually users, they also get something because then this token is liquid. They don't have to wait for the withdrawal queue yeah. and so on. Yeah. It will be very interesting to see, first of all, whether the uh, Ethereum ETF will be approved by May. Yes. Um, and how the community deals with the potential 
power grab from that inflow from exactly. the ETF issuers. Um, if you want to follow everything related to this, follow Mass's research at stenoresearch.com. You also get access to Mass's portfolio on a running basis if you buy access to our crypto research. And as per usual, we have a 14 days free trial for everyone um, interested in following you, Mass. Uh, we'll also make sure to um, to invite you to this podcast from time to time on this channel. And um, I also think that we can uh, reveal here that we are looking into various other types of content on crypto, yes. both on YouTube and on this podcast channel. Uh, so stay tuned for more from Mass and his team. Um, basically, one of the very few teams uh, in Europe providing this kind of institutional level yes. crypto research. Matt's good seeing you and uh, best wishes for the Ethereum <laughs> ETF process to you. Thank you. So, Mikkel, we're back in the studio from the interview with uh, with Mass Epperhart, and um, that's quite interesting trends that we see in the Absolutely. crypto space. Um, Incredible. Go check it out on our webpage, stenoresearch.com, if, if you're interested in an institutional level crypto research. Uh, not a lot of companies offer this, uh, but we're on uh, on the forefront of this. Yeah. And a little teaser, you're going to be gone next week, uh, so I'll, uh, uh, I'll be taking over the show for one week. We're going to be talking gold. Yeah, okay. Really <laughs> talking gold. So a little teaser for that. When you say that I'm gone next week. Yeah, no, no, like I'm not gone. <laughs> Away. That's the correct term. <laughs> uh, was that a death threat? <laughs> 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 but Miguel, um while I'm away next week, yeah. um, I'll be traveling uh, London, among other things. So, so please uh, write my inbox if, if you're interested in meeting. Uh, we have a big central bank week ahead of us. Um, that's what I'm trying to, to focus on here. Bank of Japan the Federal Reserve, and then also the Bank of England. Um, and the Bank of Japan meeting is exceptionally interesting, given that we've seen conclusions on these wage rounds in Japan over the past week. For example, Toyota negotiating wages with their employees. And we're talking almost record high Wage growth, Miguel. Absolutely, and the the expectation is, or the the, the sort of the, the the historical tendency is that Toyota would only conclude these deals after some sort of consultation with the government uh, and the central bank. So 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 the expectation is that this will uh, lead to to a historic decision for the central bank. Yeah, out of negative territory, <laughs> but we're probably talking a hike of 10 basis points. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that's a big step in Japan. Uh, it would be a small step elsewhere, obviously. Symbolic value is yeah. huge of that, yeah. It is. Um, one thing I've noticed is that our model package, uh, we now run um, PCA models on the entire asset landscape across all assets. Uh, we run our uh, volatility-based process on FX. Uh, we run our rebalancing process on FX. Uh, so everything related to the yen actually points toward, towards a weaker Japanese yen here, despite yeah. this move. Um, and that's quite interesting because it doesn't really rhyme with the vanilla take that, well, okay, they hike interest rates, well, the currency has to appreciate. Uh, I guess this is in part driven by this resurgence of US inflation that we've seen, typically very bad news for the Japanese yen. Um, but it's also driven by a slow but sure process towards accepting that the Federal Reserve cannot cut interest rates to the same extent. Very, very interesting. And and that that marginal move is simply bigger than what's happening in Japan. Those ten basis points. Who could care? Who, I, I don't yeah. care if 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 it means that the Federal Reserve will not cut by twenty five basis points. That means that fifteen basis points move in the favor of the dollar, right? So, Mikkel. This cutting cycle from the Federal Reserve, um, obviously we get some news from them on the path ahead. They'll, they'll probably not move policy on, on, on uh, interest rates on, uh, on Wednesday. If, I mean, that would be a major shocker. But we'll get some news on the path ahead. And I'd like to ask you as a political analyst, do you think they favor cutting way ahead of the election or close to the election? Because cutting interest rates just ahead of the election could look like political interference yes absolutely and, and and i mean the 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 effects would be greater of doing it doing it earlier perhaps but i think that in my opinion my my best estimation is that uh, they're they're simply afraid to right now mm -hmm. <laughs> they're simply afraid to add more gasoline to the fire uh and they 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 have to see more numbers to decide that on the other hand they're very afraid to 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 uh, 
to make a, to make this this shift in policy official because in the eyes of many they have more or less promised or very indicated yeah. uh, the cuts. So if they say we're not going to cut, they have to say it at some point if they're not going to cut. But when are they going to say that they're not going to cut? That's also the the, the thing. <laughs> I th- I'm I'm not sure if we're there that I uh, there yet, uh, there yet. I think the the um, the cautious cautiousness of 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 is, is um, will dominate right now. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if you look at market pricing right now, the market is starting to convince itself that they will cut less than yeah. what they promised, quote unquote, in the dot plot for yeah. December. And we'll obviously get a new dot plot. Uh, my best guess would be that they only promise two rate cuts now. Uh, and that would sort of lead them down the path of guiding the markets not to expect as much. Exactly. Um, I think that's the direction they'll go slowly uh, yeah. lowering expectations for cut, if that makes sense, yeah. uh, uh, to the point where they where they don't do it at all. Uh, um, but they're afraid to make big splashes or big big shifts, which could really affect the, 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 yeah. the trend in markets. And then the Bank of England, um, obviously a bank stuck in a quite different situation, um, especially with service inflation still running at high levels in the UK uh, because of a lack of inflow of uh, immigrants. Uh, That's at least one one reason. Uh, Because of um, the exit from the European Union, at least that's also a a partial reason here. Um, And because of this very service-driven UK economy overall. But I am of the view that there is a massive window of opportunity for the Bank of England over the next quarter. If you look at service inflation in March, April and May, and by the way, also February of 2023, we were talking extremely elevated growth month on month. So when you measure the year on year inflation uh, on services in the UK for the quarter ahead, we're talking about a sharp decline in momentum year over year, even if the progress kind of stalls on a month on month basis. I know this is technical, but the point here is that They have all the tailwind in the world to communicate that they're moving towards easier policies. While the Federal Reserve is stuck in a situation where the year-over-year numbers are starting to move in a direction that that is sort of moving away from their target. And that's a a tricky situation to to maneuver as a central bank. You, You obviously like the situation where inflation converges towards target. And we still have that both in the Eurozone and in the UK. And that makes the whole a whole world uh, of a difference when we look at policy making right now. Yeah. So, so my best guess ahead of this big week is that the story that dollar rates cannot come down will will sort of guide the overall market while interest rates can come down in Europe. Yeah. I agree completely. I think the, the 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 data available, the data supporting these decisions, is 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 easier to uh, to digest in Europe, perhaps, mm-hmm. like of better words. I think it, the, situa- the, the the situation is simply too too complex in the US for them to make any definite decisions to cut or not. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It will be a big week, and uh, in terms of our portfolio, we're still rotating uh, in the direction of uh, the Mister Market being right on commodities. <laughs> uh, Weaver. In this copper trade, we we were in this silver trade, we were in this oil trade, ahead of these breakouts out of range. Uh, the technical picture looks extremely compelling for the broad commodity basket right now. Uh, and I think it is slowly but surely supported by um, early green shoots out of China. Uh, also, if you look at uh, sh- shipping activity, um, both in Shanghai, uh, but if you pair it also with the, the sort of import end of the <laughs> equation uh, in U.S. ports, it looks like um, a very positive spiral is is ongoing in uh, in volumes right now. Um, to me, another sign that the manufacturing apparatus is gaining momentum in China. Um, and that would be a big story for this year because True. no one out there dares to think of a positive scenario out of China. Nope. I mean, we've invited... I don't know how many uh, on this podcast to talk about China and they keep repeating everything is bad. Yeah. Um, the real sector is crap. Sure. But it's pretty obvious by now. Um, yeah. So from a marginal perspective in markets, I'm not sure that the next story is one of abysmal trends in China. It could be one of less abysmal trends. And that makes a world of difference for the Mr. Market. 
Mikkel, let's leave it at that for this week. Uh, I'll <laughs> hand over <laughs> the studio to you next week uh, as I'm in London. Um, and um, to those of you watching or listening to the show, thank you very much again for, for doing so. Remember that we have a 14-day trial uh, to our research service on the webpage. We'll put the link in the description. Remember that we run actual money behind our portfolio. Uh, remember to go check out Mass Eberhardt and, and his team's crypto portfolio. A lot of valuable insight there. Uh, and then remember our disclaimer now that we're talking about trade ideas because uh, here is Gennaro Cazzuso disclaiming our trade ideas. Sometimes may be good, sometimes may be shit. Mostly good this week, outside of Nat Gas, but I'm not yeah. divorced yet, Michael. So. No, no, not as well as not doing as well as Mass Mass's portfolio. No, 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 no. But, uh, um, we'll get there. You you cannot beat crypto no. at the moment. That's um, <laughs> if you can.